what do you like to do in your free time? Oh, I like to, I like to do most anything, play with animals mostly, and uh, vodka is kind of a hobby. And, uh... Mike, come on! Mike, what is your deal, oh, man? Oh, come on, man! You've been riding me all day. Mike, you're playing like Betty White out there. That's not what your girlfriend said. Oh, baby. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, sweetie. Honey badger doesn't give a sh. <laughs> Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Molly Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And this is Dog Edition. Today we are taking a special journey and appreciation down memory lane as we take a look at the career of Betty White, who was, for so many Americans and people around the world, a true pet lover. We always wanted to have her on our show here at Dog Edition. We never quite made that. So this episode is dedicated to Betty White. So pause what you're doing, leash up your dog, and let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? So from that date line at the top of the show, you got the sense that there are two people here in Maui, Hawaii with the same last name. That's right, because Molly Jacobson, my wife, is joining me. This is actually the second time you've been on Dog Edition, Molly. Yes, it is. I got to talk about all sorts of wonderful gifts for the holiday, and now I get to speak with you about probably the most wonderful human that uh, the planet has been gifted with for the last nearly 100 years, Betty White. That's right. This week would have been her 100th birthday on Monday. And uh, People Magazine actually had done a cover story about her 100th birthday. They (coughs) printed a little too early because she uh, passed away on New Year's Eve, just a few days shy of her 100th birthday. But that gives us the opportunity to appreciate all these obituaries and remembrances and honors that have been shared and put together uh, over the last few weeks now uh, about Betty White's legacy and what she has done for animals. So we decided to talk to people who you might not have heard of, but who knew Betty White personally. We're going to speak today with two individuals, Christine Benninger, who is the director of the Guide Dogs for the Blind, which is one of the, which is actually the largest guide dog organization in North America. And we're also going to be speaking with Mark Lepis, who is a producer of television. He worked at Jimmy Fallon Late Night and produced Betty White on five different appearances and got to meet her in a way that most people don't get to. So to get started, Molly, what are your greatest memories of Betty White? Okay, this is kind of weird. My favorite, favorite memory of Betty White Mm -hmm. is actually from my childhood. Um, We were sort of latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. I was the oldest. I have two younger brothers. And we did not get to watch a lot of television. We were those weird kids who got like half an hour of TV a night in the 70s and the 80s when everybody else got to watch as much TV as they wanted to. And so when my mother started working, we would come home in the afternoons and we would do our homework real quick. And then we would get to uh, watch shows that were in syndication. Mm -hmm. And as the years progressed, I didn't watch the television as much as my younger brothers did. And I will never forget watching my brother, Paul, watching Golden Girls and especially watching Betty White. I think that Paul was madly in love with Betty White as like a 10 year old. That's a little weird. Why? (laughs) Why? Why? Because she was so lovely. She was just Paul. Paul is this really lovely human being himself. Yeah. He loved sweet, small things. Like he liked Smurf, little Smurf statues. And he loved those little tiny rubber animals. Mm -hmm. And I think that he saw in Betty White and in her, certainly in her character, Rose, Mm -hmm. this lovely, precious person who just embodied love. 
Well, Rose Nyland definitely embodied love with a certain sort of sense of naivete that made her jokes all the more funny. You're mad, aren't you? <laughs> Rose Nyland, every man I know is watching this show. This live show. This live show about lesbian lovers of Miami. <laughs> Every man you know is watching? Hey, we could beat the prices right. Rose, we can't kill you here because there are cameras. Now, how did this happen? Oh, I don't know. They just said they wanted two women who loved each other and slept together. We do not sleep together. Yes, you did. Last month, when, when Blanche was having her room repainted because the plaster behind her headboard all fell out. <laughs> and Rose Nyland had her own style, but let's contrast that to another role, the role that I first knew Betty White mm-hmm. on, which is when she worked on uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show, and she was <laughs> quite the opposite of that. She was a nymphomaniac <laughs> who uh, really was... I think a bit raunchy. She was a manhunter. And and that I think speaks to her range as an actress. Here she is on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Why don't you put it in your bedroom? You must need something in there to relieve the tedium. <laughs> I don't know what you two are laughing at, but I'll take a chance it's dirty. <laughs> I want to be cremated and have my ashes thrown on Robert Redford. <laughs> So Mark Lepus, the producer who worked at NBC, uh, mentioned that this dynamic range that Betty White had was pretty extraordinary. You look at like Sue Ann Nivens and you look at um, uh, Rose on The Golden Girls and you couldn't find more different people. You know, one was a a sweet dimwit and the other one was this manipulative uh, man-eater, you know, and it's like that whole kind of like salty and sweet, you know, it's a, she's the chocolate and the peanut butter. Um, That's great. I mean, it's just, it's an undervalued skill. That's a very long winded way of saying she's very good at what she did. Okay. So this is dog edition and we focus a lot on dogs. So let's talk a little bit about Betty White's charitable work. Because for over 35 years, she was a supporter of guide dogs for the blind. And one of the ways that she supported them was by allowing herself to go up for auction. So she would basically uh, be the grand prize in an annual holiday auction that the charity put on. Here is Christine Benninger. She was gracious in allowing us to auction her off for, you know, a lunch with Betty. And people would bid on the opportunity to go to lunch with her. And you would meet her at her favorite restaurant in Santa Monica that had been there for like a gazillion years, right? It was that old style restaurant where, you know, it was booths and it was red leather, you know, and, uh, you know, the food was like steak and, you know, I mean, all the stuff that, you know, was sort of a traditional 1950s restaurant. And there was a special door that Betty would come in through. This restaurant basically allowed her to kind of come in through a side door so she didn't go through the entire restaurant and get stopped all the way along the way. And you would have essentially two hours with Betty. Yeah. In fact, one of our current board members, actually, he and his husband had uh, one. It's probably about 10 years ago. And um, oh, my God. I mean, they were glowing, absolutely glowing. And everything that I just told you from the standpoint that here you are meeting with, you know, a top star and she made it all about them and they just had the best time ever. So Guide Dogs for the Blind does some amazing work. They are, as I mentioned earlier, the largest organization of its kind in North America with over 800 dogs a year that they help place with people who who need. 850? It's extraordinary. My word. So thousands of people are helping to raise these dogs, these puppies, these Mm -hmm. perfect golden retrievers that are perfectly trained. But not every puppy gets to go into service. And those that don't are called career change dogs. Those are (laughs) dogs that basically, you know, for one reason or another, they, they didn't, they didn't follow the instructions perfectly or more likely than not, they had some sort of physical ailment like hip dysplasia or something like that, that makes them not suitable for being a service dog because they have to be 
perfectly dependable as a service dog. And so those dogs that don't make it are known as career change dogs. That's adorable. And Betty White adopted one of those dogs, a dog named Pontiac. Christine tells us about that. She loved her dogs. And she actually adopted one of our career change golden retrievers. And it was funny because Pontiac was his name. He had all the guide dog training, but, you know, guide work just wasn't going to be his thing. And so he was impeccably trained. And what's extraordinary is that while the dog was perfect when Betty got it, maybe she corrupted it a little bit. (laughs) When we saw Betty and Pontiac about a year later, wow, (laughs) he'd he'd kind of forgotten all his training. but. It was perfect for Betty. It's okay he's on the couch, you know? (laughs) Christine views Betty White actually as a role model for so many people, including for herself. For me personally, first of all, I think in this day and age, it's hard to find role models. And for me, I think somebody who leads with love, leads with compassion, leads with kindness particularly in this day and age, it's really hard to do, right? You know, because we all have strong opinions about things. So finding somebody who does that, who genuinely does that, that's a pretty powerful role model. I think she's an excellent role model for all of us. I will just say that she was an extraordinary lady. You know, extraordinary in her work, but I think, again, just as a human being, right? Somebody who leads with compassion, with kindness, and with love. You know, it's something for all of us to strive for. And one of the tributes that the organization is doing to honor Betty is they are naming a dog that is now unborn. It's, you know, in utero. It's expected to be born soon. They're naming it Betty Rose. Isn't that awesome? Oh, that's so sweet. And that's in honor of, obviously, Betty White and then Rose, Rose Nyland. Nyland uh, yeah. yeah. That's so, very sweet. So Betty White's service orientation and helping people and connecting dogs and people will continue on through this lovely tribute. A living tribute. Through this living tribute. A living, panting, sweet, bouncy, kind, obedient, lovely tribute. I think that's awesome. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, we will talk a little bit more with Mark Lepis from NBC Jimmy Fallon Show and talk a little bit about some of the backstage things that he saw when he worked one-on-one with Betty White. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Oh, every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. Oh, I want to run. I want to sniff. Ooh, I want to find a good stick to carry. Oh, I want to roll in the grass. Oh, and warm my belly in the sun. Oh, I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pop. The green, grassy beef liver smell wakes my senses. Oh, you may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy. <laughs> it infuses any food you give me with healthy life vibrancy. Oh, <laughs> I can feel it. Ever pop traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. I'm so grateful to be your dog. And for the ever pop you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Ever pup, every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. So Mark Lepis only got to know Betty White, he figures, for about six hours. Six hours total? Six hours total <laughs> over five different appearances wow. when she came to, to work on the show. And the way that it works 
it, that I didn't know this is that these producers would basically work with the guest and make them, you know, kind of prep them before they got to the show and then spend time with them one on one while they were there and make sure they were always, uh, you know, had companionship. So, like a guest whisperer, a guest whisperer, and someone to basically make it a little bit easier. And what we here at Dog Podcast Network call a green room experience, mm-hmm. but extending this to wherever they are in the studio in the complex. And, and it's kind of neat. And Mark got to meet Betty in a way that, you know, most people don't. And Mark just commented on Betty's humanity and how, in some ways, Betty reminded him of a really good dog. She's always been old for as long as I've been alive. And I think that the thing about her that struck me first, you know, the whole point of the title, was that she was very tactile. And she just had this sort of way about her that was like the uber prototypical, amazing, like, grandma she had that quality which is why i think everyone adored her so much and there was just this warmth that she projected and it was just as simple as you know that hand on your arm and that sort of absent-minded sort of stroking and this being a dog podcast it reminded me actually of that sort of you know you're petting a dog and you're not really thinking about what you're doing you're just in contact with another thing with another creature with another being and she had that it was just innate in her and it tracks given her, you know, her love of animals and all. And just the experience of working with her was, I mean, especially someone with that much experience and like accomplishment, just in terms of longevity, like you never know what you're going to get with a guest, but she couldn't have been more exactly what you want. She was the Betty White you wanted her to be. And it wasn't effort for her because that's just who she was. So that petting, that, that squeezing that Betty White did for Mark actually, Uh Uh, inspired a title for a piece that he wrote in Medium, and which is an online publication, called Betty White Touched Me, and It Was a Thrill. It's such a great piece. It's such a great piece. We will have a link to it in the show notes for today's episode. One of the things that Mark pointed out is that Betty White had fans of all ages. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like I remember my grandmother, I would sit and watch a Mary Tyler Moore show with my grandmother and she loved it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you know, a decade later, she loved the Golden Girls and she just loved Betty White. So, mm-hmm. And then at the same time, my little brother is watching and he's loving her. It's just, so, I, mean, her, I guess when you work for 65 years or however long she, I mean, her career was really long. And what's interesting is Betty started in the earliest days of television when there was only live television they as she said once they hadn't figured out how to tape things uh (laughs) which is true uh and she was also quite a workaholic in those early days of television she worked some long hours we saw an interview where she talked about working a shift where for five and a half hours she was live on the air had a little bit of a lunch break and then in the evening went on and did a 30-minute sitcom type show, all of this live. And they asked her, well, how did did you memorize your script? She said, no, I just basically knew a little bit of the blocking and a little bit of the storyline, and they had to make it up on the spot and be in character. And she was just a consummate performer. I mean, she loved to work, and she jokes, you know, when she tells people she really was in it for the money. And I think she was, but she also really, really loved what she was doing. I think that's saying that it was, she used to say a lot uh, in interviews that she was a money whore. You are more popular and more successful and you're working harder now than I think I've ever seen you work. Well, I'm such a, I'm such a whore. I can't say no. To you. <laughs> I think that was her sort of body way of of actually saying, I really like to work. It's what I want to do. And uh, I'm certain that the money meant something to her, but I don't think that you work as hard and as long as she does, unless you really love what you're doing. Well, speaking of body ways, I talked a little (laughs) bit about that with Mark because she had this style that was sort of lasciviousness and, 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 but she was also grandmotherly at the same time, which is a, an interesting contradiction. She, was able to sort of have that sort of, you know, sly, like you said, that lasciviousness, but it was always sort of, I mean, it was innocent because it was never like dirty. She was able to sort of like really kind of like thread that needle because like 
it was like just all double entendre stuff. It wasn't like she was being this filthy, you know, whatever. Like it wouldn't make sense coming from her. I mean, I think it speaks to the the real skill involved for for her as a performer because that that's a touch. Like that's something that you know in someone else's hands might not work the same way. Now. One of the things that they did on the Jimmy Fallon show are these sketches or these things that are recurrent, you know, jokes or memes or, or things that went on for a while. And uh, one of them that they had Betty White do was beer pong. Did you ever play beer pong, Molly? <laughs> Once or twice, I hated beer pong. And it's where you take the, the ping pong ball and yeah. you toss it across the table. Right. And, you try and if to your get... ball lands in their cup, they have to drink with whatever's in it. Mm hmm. And so you have to try to get it in each of their cups because if you get it in the same one twice, there's nothing for them to drink. And I wasn't good at getting in any of any of them. But it's 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 a hard game because first, like you better get that ball in the other person's first right. so they get drunk before you do. Because the the drunker you get, the worse you do. I always lost that game. I'm, I'm sure I, you I did. I was really bad at because first of all, I <laughs> well, I suck at that at that type of stuff, and then I really don't hold my alcohol that well. So <laughs> no, it was uh, it was uh, uh, secrets here on Dog Edition. Right, right. Uh, it was uh, it was a game that I never savored very much. And you know what? Jimmy Fallon beat Betty White not once. <laughs> Twice, I think every time she did it on the show, he beat her and she had to drink. But as Mark <laughs> says, she was a very good sport about it. Betty was not the first to play. We had had actual pro tennis players playing it. And, you know, she just, she elevated that. Like at one point, like, I, you know, Jimmy sank the first ball and she did this move where she sort of snorted and like squared her shoulders off and almost like she hiked up her bra you know what I mean? Like she's like got to set herself and then she drank it. And it was just that kind of stuff is like, that's where she just killed it. Now, of course, Betty White is known for her humor in addition to her love for dogs. And so can you imagine what it would be like to pitch the famous eminent Betty White a joke? No, I cannot. I don't know that I'd have that kind of courage. <laughs> Mark Lepus did. And he tells us the story. She let me picture a joke, you know, basically like there is this sort of strange church state relationship between writers and producers in late night shows. At least that's my experience. And, you know, it's a lot of staying in your lane. And if you tried to be funny as a producer, it, it would sometimes be met with a uh, reserve because that's not your job. And I think it varies from place to place. So I'd be clear, but that seemed to be sort of an undercurrent there. And so I had produced her one time before and she was coming through for Saturday Night Live and you could feel sort of the excitement around it. And that, and just the level of comfort, I just sort of threw it out there. And I just said to her, I said, now I don't want to be presumptuous, but I had an idea for something you could say when Jimmy asked you about Saturday Night Live. And so I don't want to presume to give you a joke. And she goes, are you kidding? I will always take a good joke. Betty was known as a humanitarian, and, and she was basically a, a person of the people. She really connected with all kinds of people. And that's, what I think, what makes us all adore and love her today so much. Absolutely. Her staff, she you know, obviously she had an agent, Jeff Witches, who had been her agent for a very long time, and Mark knew him, was a friend. They would play cards together, and they connected. And Mark wrote to Jeff shortly after Betty passed. You know, I was so taken up by it. I ended up emailing him over the weekend after she'd passed. And I just said, look, you know, it's been like, what, 10 years since I produced her. And she's still kind of lingering. And I, that speaks volumes to her. And I think about the relationship you guys have, or had rather. And uh, it's sort of like what you want. Like that's, you like the, the idea of being somebody's partner and having it matter beyond that is, that's the wish. It's not like he didn't have other clients. He did. But clearly theirs was a very specific and special relationship. You know, he was sort of the, the gatekeeper and took care of whatever arrangements. And like, he was just part of that sort of little traveling group. And it was just people that had been with her forever. So it was like, he, he was great. And he was always like super supportive of the ideas we had. And he, he would push her to do stuff. And I'm not in a inappropriate or like, you know, he wasn't like working or like a, it wasn't Oliver Twist. Like, 
get to work. Uh, I don't hear about your hips. But I think what was great about Jeff, he, you know, he, he tested her. He pushed her. We talked a little bit about beer pong, which is one of the things that Betty did on the show with <laughs> Jimmy Fallon. But another sketch that Betty really loved, because I'm not sure if she really loved the beer pong. <laughs> I what, think she, she was a great sport, wasn't she? She was a good sport. She was a good sport, and she knew what would make for a good laugh. Yes, she knew where the laughs were, and she understood what entertainment was. She was a consummate professional. One of the sketches that they did was they, they reenacted Password, the, the game show. And that was a game show that had a special place in Betty White's heart because that is where she met the love of her life. Alan Ludden. Alan Ludden. And Alan, he knew at first sight that he wanted to marry Betty. Betty wasn't so sure. Do you remember the story that, that we heard about that? Oh, yeah, where, um, where he, he bought her a beautiful ring. Mm-hmm. And he proposed to her, and then, and then she said no, <laughs> and and he put it on a on a chain around his neck so that every time she saw him, he was wearing a wedding a wedding engagement ring around his neck. He said, "You might as well get used to it because you're gonna eventually you're gonna be wearing something like that." Right. And then a year later, she said, "Okay, fine, I'll marry you." And yeah. then she said it was, and she'd been married twice before. Right. Right. And she never had any kids. That's kind of, I think, one of the things. And she she never had any kids because she was such a workaholic, like we've talked about. And she also had children. The pets were her, her children. Yeah. I don't remember where I heard her say this, but she said, I love children. <clears throat> the only problem with children, they grow up to be people. <laughs> and I just like animals better than people. It's that simple. <laughs> I can resemble that. <laughs> that remark, that's that's something that um, I personally connect to. It's not that I, I actually did want to have children, as you well know, but not having children and being able to really focus on things that are very important to me is a real opportunity that I think um, people like Betty White uh, trailblazed. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, she had a huge impact, I think, in her gentle, sweet, loving way. I think she had a big impact in many different ways on our society and our culture. There have been lots of tributes of Betty, but one of the tributes that I saw that Betty participated in was pretty extraordinary. A few years back, the AFI, the American Film Institute, did a tribute to Morgan Freeman. And Betty White was the opening act. Is that really Betty White with? So that was a little trip down memory lane uh, of her celebrating Morgan Freeman as we celebrate Betty White. When you think maybe in five or 10 years, into the future, do you think that people will still have such fondness for Betty White? I can't see why not. I think that she truly, she just seemed like what she was. I believe everybody who knew her well and those who, like our guests today, knew her for only a little bit, Mm -hmm. it seems like she, she was the real article. She was genuinely a good person through and through and people who are genuinely good and also public figures tend to be remembered. Mm. And I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be remembering her fondly. Not only that, she made us laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. And uh, you put together unending compassion and love and laughter. And that's a recipe for longevity in the, in the public memory, I think. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. And of course, her love for animals. Yeah. One of the things that I think we'll leave you with is, is a story that we heard. She was on the uh, on a number of boards and, and support groups around animals, including she was on the board of directors of the Los Angeles Zoo. And so she had a few extra privileges being on the board there. One of which is that she could go to the zoo during off hours and like hug the koala bears and 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 get close to the animals. And Mark Lepus mentioned one of the things that was so different about her than maybe 
the Kardashians. She just loved it. I mean, she she would be able to go uh, to the LA Zoo after hours and hang out and like hold the koalas. And and again, typical her. She's like, I never wanted to do it when the guests were around because I didn't want to show off because it was such a unique privilege. And I'm like, a Kardashian would go while you were there, interrupt your field trip, uh, tell the kids to get out so they could touch the koalas. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a different... She just comes from, I think, just better stock. I feel like everybody, whether you met her or not, you have an overwhelming feeling of warmth when you think of her. And what a what a legacy to have. Betty White was definitely not our Kardashian. She's definitely from an era uh, gone but not forgotten. And it was a lot of fun to have you on our show today to to remember Betty White as we did this tribute. Molly, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And I'm really honored to be able to sit here and, and think a little bit about Betty White and how it seems that whether you you were a dog or a koala <laughs> or a fox or a snake or a human, she had that gentle but firm touch that communicates uh, real love. Mm. And so I find her just very inspiring. And the more that I've learned about her love for animals and her love for dogs specifically, the more I realize that we're all very, very lucky to have her on the side of the angels, as my grandmother used to oh. say when someone passed, that uh, maybe she's watching over us and over all of the dogs and the dog lovers. I'm sure she was well received in heaven. I bet there were a lot of people waiting on the other side of that rainbow bridge. I bet a lot of dogs, <laughs> a lot of wagging tails. A lot. And maybe maybe some non-dog animals as well. Molly, thanks for being with us. And thank you for joining us today on Dog Edition. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, I hope you will do us a favor and tell a friend or two about the show. Make sure to follow us in your favorite podcast app. We're also available on YouTube. And join us for the next episode of Dog Edition, where we will talk about dogs who talk back. That's right. There is some new technology to enable your dog to talk to you. And we'll discuss that next time on Dog Edition. From all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'm James Jacobson, wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Is there something, is there one thing out there that Betty White still wants to do? Uh, Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs>